Welcome to Solar Punk Life. We're here at Small Axe Farm with Alec and Kelly, and we're going to be interviewing them on how they do what they do here and, and finding out what it is to be a sustainable modern farmer. So uh, you've given us a bit of a tour already, but start from the beginning. Tell us uh, why you started doing this and, and, and what it is exactly that you do. Uh, we are a direct-to-consumer farm, small farm. Uh, basically, we buy young animals or breed breed animals here on the farm. Um, we take them up to finishing weight, and then we take them to the processor, and then the, the final product goes straight to our customer. So what makes it different than, say, meat that I'm getting in a grocery store? And th this is where the solar punk comes into mm -hmm. it, and, and one of the reasons why we're here actually talking and doing this tour. Um, well, in general, you know, it's the difference between a grocery store tomato and a tomato that you grow in your own garden. I mean, if, if you've ever had a homegrown tomato, they really shouldn't even be called the same thing. They're just completely different in terms of taste Absolutely. and texture and, and health. Um, and so that's kind of our mindset here, that we want to raise the highest quality meats um, at prices that people can afford. And we want to do it in a way that um, provides a profit to, to us, but also in a way that... Um, heals the land. You know. When I read about your farm and your operations, you, you had a, a blurb mm. that said that the animals are your partners mm -hmm. and they have a good life mm -hmm. and one bad day. Mm -hmm. So the animals aren't just a commodity. You know, it's not a barrel of oil. Um, they're living creatures and um, they have rights that, you know, we respect. Um, but when I say they're partners, we have a long-term vision of what this farm in particular, but agriculture in general should look like. What does healthy agriculture look like? Um, and so our animals help us to reach that goal. Uh, they do that by shaping the land. So for example, where a conventional farm might focus on applying certain fertilizers or tilling land or clear cutting forest to achieve their goals, um, to whatever extent we can, we like to use the animals to reach those goals. They, the animals are our center of our fertility program. The animals are the center of our um, biodiversity program. They help us to increase the pasture health. They help us to create pasture where there was no pasture before. How long have you been here? Mm -hmm. And how long do you see before you really get to your full vision? Mm, absolutely. Um, I've been farming since 2006. Uh, I moved down to Rockingham County in 2009, um, but moved to this farm uh, just last year. So how much of that previous farm helped you figure out what to look for when buying this one? Uh, it completely informed um, what I was looking for. You know, I, I've told, I told you before that if I were to design a farm from scratch, it would look just like this. Uh, it's It's got everything that you could want. It's got uh, it's got pastures that are in good good shape. It's got uh, woodlands. Um, it's got year-round water. It's got a uh, good temperate climate. You know, um, the, the views are great. The neighborhood is great. Um, I'm in a rural agricultural community. You know, that right there is, is very important that I'm not bumping up against suburbia. My neighbors have cattle. You know, um, my neighbor will come down and say, have you seen my cows? You know, and it's just, it's what you do. You help each other out. And um, that's, that's great. And there's other ways to cooperate with those other farms too, whether it's trading and bartering, helping mm -hmm. out with the mm -hmm. different chores around, mm -hmm. um, lending equipment that's too expensive for one farmer to mm -hmm. have all of the things and it's, it's much better mm -hmm. sort of spread out and cooperative. Mm -hmm. So you were telling me earlier mm -hmm. about how much, how many calories you can produce per square acre versus mm -hmm. another method. Mm -hmm. uh, what was that that you said before? Sure. Um, well, in a conventional farming system, it's, it's monocropping, right? I grow corn or I grow soybeans or, you know, I raise cattle. Um, I think that um, the most successful type of farming tries to integrate as many different revenue streams and um, methods of production as possible on the same land, right? Land is our biggest constraint. It's the most expensive thing to get into farming. It's the one it's, thing they're not making any more of. Exactly. It's competitive in this area. So if I can find ways to stack enterprises on the same land to, to use little niches and corners that might otherwise go to waste. You know, for example, we have a gully back here uh, that according to the local NRCS and local farmers, it's, it's good for nothing, essentially. Um, but for me, it's the perfect place uh, to put goats. It's got exactly the type of food that they want. It's a perfect place to put um, bushes and fruit trees because of the topography, because of the water. 
So whereas that might kind of go to waste on a, a conventional monocropping farm, for, for me, that's just one more place that I can try one more thing. So tell us about the layout of this farm from like front to back and side mm -hmm. to side. Uh, it's 75 acres, um, almost exactly half pasture, half in woods. Uh, the pasture fronts up against the road uh, and the woods backs up into the mountains. Um, we have a creek, Elk Run Creek. Uh, the headwaters are just up that way uh, that divides the property right in half. Um, and it's got a great mix of, of um, topography as well. It's not just flat, not just mountains. It's got a little bit of everything. A good mixture of woods, um, hardwood, softwood. Uh, now, you know, when I picture pasture land mm -hmm. as, you know, the suburbanite here, mm -hmm. uh, I just picture flat. Yeah. Like, what's the advantage of having some hill and, mm -hmm. and having a gully and, and, and a stream? How does that all feed in? Yeah. So uh, within the last 10 to 15 years, any crop croppable land has been put in crop production. That's just the biggest return you can get for your investment. So if I've got any kind of land that I can put in corn or soybean, that's what it goes for in this area. Um, Traditionally, it was more marginal ground that was used for, for grazing. So um, this area is very well suited for grazing. Um, there are some spots that could be cropped. I have no desire to do that. Uh, I think grazing is, is uh, more profitable. It's uh, better for the land. So <laughs> for, for those of us who aren't familiar with the Shenandoah Valley, um, you know a lot about the history of it. Mm -hmm. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the history of the Shenandoah Valley and how it relates to, to what you're doing here with this project. Absolutely. Uh, so I was born and raised in, in the valley. And um, you know, when Europeans first came to America, um, they were exploring the new continent and uh, the, the Spaniards were writing reports of the valley that people really didn't believe. Uh, they were describing it almost in uh, like Eden, you know, like just beautiful and lush. And so when uh, Governor Spotswood in the 1600s, he wanted to send an expedition over the Blue Ridge Mountains. It's the first time white people crossed the Blue Ridge Mountains. And they came back with a report saying this valley had grass that was so tall, you could tie it into a knot over the neck of your horse. So you have what you think of the prairies, the tall grass prairies out wet. We had that here in the Shenandoah Valley. So the thinking was that the, the Native Americans who were here had been uh, managing the landscape as kind of a hunting preserve through burning and through selective cutting. Um, and so this area was extremely fertile. And so um, the, the valley has always been the center of Virginia agriculture. Uh, it was fought over constantly during the Civil War because it was the breadbasket. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, these farming practices have really degraded the, the area. Um, the estimates we have are that about three feet of topsoil Ooh have washed out of the valley in the last 150 years. And it's, it's all gone into the Chesapeake Bay. So if you're ever driving up and down the highway and you look to the side and you see limestone sticking, that's, that was not there 100 years ago. That's the ground has, has disappeared. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things that's so exciting about regenerative agriculture is that not only do we reverse or stop that process, but we can reverse it. We can start building that soil back. And that's a really exciting proposition. And there are, I've been a lot of places in my life. I've lived in Texas, mm. uh, Pennsylvania, uh, born and raised in Baltimore, Maryland. There are few places that I really resonate to and come back to. Mm. Uh, this is one of them. Mm. Uh, you know, we've, I've, We've moved, even my family, we've been in Northern Virginia, places like that. We always end up back in the Shenandoah mm -hmm. Valley um, because it's beautiful. Yeah. And it is everything that they've said it was yeah. and, and is. Um, and can I speak to that? Yeah. You know, that, that ties in with the overall philosophy that, that I have of farming, that, you know, uh, traditional farming has a um, kind of a bad connotation of it's stinky, it's noisy, it's dirty, it's ugly, you know. You guys have, have been around here I and mean, this is it's beautiful and uh the longer we farm here the more beautiful the place is going to get uh, and that just tells me we're on the right track that that this is a win-win-win you know uh, what we're doing is good for the animals it's good for the land it's good for the farmers and it's good for the local community and stinky and dirty and noisy is fun <laughs> <laughs> it is fun when, when you come home after a day of working on a tractor you feel like you put in a good day's work but there's better ways of doing it i can tell you that mm -hmm. What does a typical day look like for you on the farm? Mm. Uh, do you do this full time? Mm. What else do you have going on? 
So I'm a full-time high school teacher. I teach biology, which dovetails nicely with um, what I'm doing here. Um, but the actual day-to-day -day requirements are very low, um, usually about a half an hour per day. Um, and you can set things up in advance. Um, typically, it's just check the animals. Are they here? Everybody look okay? Do we have water? Um, how's the grass situation? Do I need to move them today? Or can they have another day where they are? And that's it. Um, Obviously, there's some long-term projects that we're working on, fencing and, and other infrastructure things. But for a daily basis, yeah, it's uh, it's it's quite low. There are there are times when they, it requires a bit more time. Mm -hmm. um, we recently had some cows with fevers that mm -hmm. took some time to, to mm -hmm. treat. And, mm -hmm. I don't know if you want this in there. <laughs> yeah, but on a daily basis, half an hour. Um, but you'll have days where oh, I got to spend an hour to two hours or three hours, you know, because something went wrong, somebody got their head stuck in the fence, you know, but um, typically it's, it's... That was me earlier, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and it was electrified too. <laughs> you should have so seen them. <laughs> you kind of, you sort of straddle the line between hobby farm mm. and business. Yeah. Um, and I think that's where the passion is. Yeah. So you, you, have, you have all of the aspects of someone who's doing this because they just, they like it and want to do it mm. and put the heart into it. And then you have the other side of you can make money and make this profitable for yeah. yourself and anybody else who, Absolutely. you know, whatever your future plans are. Um, and, and I think that's that's excellent. Mm -hmm. um, and that leads me into my next segue uh, of what are your plans for the land and the farm? How do you want to grow? What do you what do you envision here? Mm -hmm. uh, I envision a place that's welcoming to anybody who wants to come and enjoy the beauty and learn more about how we can uh, heal the world through regenerative agriculture. Um, it's going to be a working farm. Um, it is our primary farm. our primary purpose is to raise meat. Um, but, you know, uh, we talked about earlier, how can we stack enterprises using the same land? How can we stack enterprises? So I envision, you know, having camp uh, cabins, um, having events, having uh, perhaps a farm to table restaurant. Um, any one of these things I think would fit very nicely with workshops and things Maybe like that. Maybe a solar punk life. Uh, yeah. event. <laughs> Absolutely. That'd be great. That'd be great. Oh, we've also had discussions with some vegetable farmers to mm -hmm. try and utilize parts of the land mm -hmm. um, and also offer them a place to help, you know, do their trade as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. And to work out together, maybe eventually have chickens. And it, It's not a zero-sum game. In other words, if I give an acre to this guy, I'm not losing out. I'm gaining more than I'm giving up. Mm -hmm. And that, again, it shows you, I think, that you're on the right track. When, when, we, when we work together, uh, the sky's kind of the limit. Solar punk. Very solar, <laughs> it's very solar punk. Yeah. It's, it's community. Absolutely. And you're going to eventually, you build that community. Yeah, you have to build communities. And you have to consciously choose to do that. They don't just happen. Actively choosing to build your community is is much better way to, to grow a healthy one. And it's something we want to share and show. You know, having yeah. come, people come stay for the weekend and, and see what it's all about and educate them. I'm in. As, as, much, <laughs> as much as we can while they're here. I mean, just show them how beautiful it can be. Yeah, I think an important mindset is that it's not our farm. You know, we are temporary stewards of it. We've been entrusted with its care. And part of that mission is to share it with as many people as possible. This place would be a blessing to as many people as possible. Leave a legacy. Absolutely. Absolutely. So a lot of people, they hear the term solar punk, they immediately think solar panels. Mm -hmm. uh, and you don't have any solar panels. Mm -hmm. But what you've got here that I think is unique is, is that you're very low energy consumption mm -hmm. to begin with. Absolutely. So where do you expend energy? Where do you consume things like, uh, you know, fuel or electricity? And where do you not compared to other more traditional farming techniques? Sure. Well, the first point I would make is that we do have solar panels. Oh. The, the entire farm is a solar panel. And no, this is, this is an <laughs> important paradigm. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. This entire pasture has one job, and that's to turn sunlight, solar energy into sugar. And the better job I can do, the more efficient it becomes and the more energy we capture and we can turn into meat. So my job is to make those plants as efficient a solar panel as possible. Biology teacher. Yeah, sorry. Uh, no, I don't, I don't apologize. Uh, yeah, we, we're grass farmers. We're raising grass um, to capture sunlight and turn it into meat. Um, but in terms of, you know, actual electrical usage on the farm, we are a fraction of most, most farms. Um, if you look around here, you'll see one old pickup truck and one freezer and one fence energizer and a well. And that's basically all you need to run the place. Um, 
we don't have a tractor, but there's times when it would be helpful, um, but we absolutely don't need it. We don't do any tillage. We don't cut or make hay. Uh, we don't spray. Um, so all of those energy sinks that are common on other farms, we have none of those here. And in terms of, of transporting goods, like do you ever have to receive large deliveries of food or anything for the animals? No, absolutely not. Uh, everything that they eat is grown right here on the farm. We, we will buy a few bales of hay uh, during the winter as insurance in case it snows and they can't get to the grass. We have some stuff on standby. Um, but other than that, and we, do, yeah, uh, pigs are omnivores. That's a good point. Um, the omnivores, they require a higher plane of nutrition than strictly pasture can provide. So for that, we do buy feed and bring it in. Yeah. And we buy it in the co-op. It's was grown right here in this County. The pigs came from this County and the meat will be eaten in this County or, or right next door. And that's important. With the Prius too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get farmies tags for my Prius. That's right. You get a lot of looks when you show up to the butcher and you're loading a couple cows into a Prius. Yeah, Tell absolutely. me about your relationship with the animals and, and, and what kind of animals you've what got. What kind of animals you have and the life cycle of these animals. Sure. What, what, are, what, is, what do you do with them? How do they? Yeah, yeah that's, that's an important question. Um, so here at the farm, we raise sheep, goats, cattle, and pigs. Uh, the sheep and goats are born here. So we have closed herds, so a self, self-sustaining herd at this point. Uh, and we kind of, um, we live off the excess. You know, they, they are prolific breeders. Um, the cattle and pigs, we buy them in as younger animals and we take them to market weight uh, and take them to the processor. But um, it is an important thing to remember that they're not just walking T-bone steaks. It's a living, breathing creature that... Um, the personality. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, especially the goats, man. Uh, yeah. Goats are ornery. They I, are. Just, I've never met a, a calm goat. No, they're a pain in the butt. <laughs> you can also tell the cows part. I, that's mm -hmm. one thing I didn't know before I spend any more, before spending more time here on the mm -hmm. farm with Alec. Is you look out in a field and you see a bunch of cows, and you're like, oh, cows. But really, they have pretty individual personalities. Mm -hmm. They have quirks about them. Mm -hmm. Some are friendly, some are shy. Um, mm -hmm. And I've always been the kind of don't make friends with your food attitude, mm -hmm. but it's it's really enriching spending time with them on the year that they have here at the farm, yeah. you know, to be able to share that time. Yeah, that's our that's our goal. That you know, I I, I eat meat. Um, I have no problem with vegetarianism. It's I, I am not a vegetarian. I'm going to eat meat, and so if I'm going to eat meat, it's very important to me that I know that meat that's on my plate. Where did it come from? How was this animal treated? How was it raised? Did it live a good life? You know, these cows would not have been born otherwise. If, if somebody mm -hmm. were not going to eat them, they would never have experienced life. So my goal um, is to give them as good a life as possible. And when you fence, when you put a fence around an animal, you are taking responsibility for its life. And so I take that very seriously that um, my job is to make their time as, as pleasant as possible. And they're very happy animals. I can mm -hmm. tell you that for sure. They happy run animals. And play. Yeah, they make happy food. Yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> they play absolutely. in the field. It's fun yeah. to watch them. Well, and uh, I know firsthand because we're a customer of yours. Mm -hmm. And we bought, I think, a quarter of uh, one cow um, nine months ago or something like that. And you delivered it to us in the Prius. <laughs> and we've put that in our deep freezer and we've, we've been slowly working through that. And it is really good quality beef. And um, when you compare it to something that I buy in, in my local grocery store, it's one, less expensive. Yes. Uh, your prices are very reasonable. Two, there's multiple flavors in there that you just don't get out of uh, the processed meat that's coming through the grocery store. I, I can't explain it other than to say, it just tastes better. That comes from the diversity of the pasture. The, um, you know, in, uh, what do they call it in, in viticulture when they raise wines, they call it the terroir, right? The, the, the soil that produced this grape, you can taste that mm -hmm. in the grape. It's, it's not different with grass, uh, that the soil that we, we live on and that the plants that grow in it, that flavor goes directly into the animals. And also the pigs, you know, we supplement with a lot of peanuts and that flavor comes through as well. You know, when, um, crack open a jar of lard you smell it you just smell peanuts interesting yeah, yeah. yeah. it's great he renders lard and, and cans it to save and use for cooking mm -hmm. it's amazing mm -hmm. <laughs> if you've never had a ribeye cooked in lard it's oh. <laughs> see now i'm hungry yeah. yeah and i would like to say for anybody who doesn't believe me fat will not kill you no yeah yeah 
I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One thing to mention is the type of cow you have, the yeah. Devons, and oh, what, yeah. how they're well suited to. Yeah. So if you t if you go to the stock sale, you know the livestock auction, you just buy a cow there, and you put on pasture, it'll do okay. Um, but these are animals that have been selected for the feedlot industry. They get very tall, and they can put on a lot of weight, but you've got to just pour grain on them. That's what the industry wants, and so that's what farmers in this area produce. Um, I buy my cattle from a guy who raises uh, a, a breed called Devons. They're from England. Um, they were never bred for the feedlot. They were bred to fatten and marble on grass year-round. Kind of the equivalent of heirloom cows. Right? Ab absolutely. And uh, they don't get as big. You know, mine will finish out at about 1,200 pounds, whereas an Angus might be 15, 1,600 pounds. Um, but the flavor's better. It's healthier for you. My cost is far, far lower. It's grass finished. It's just a win, win, win all the way around. And they're very docile. Yeah, and they're a joy to work with. Yeah. So let's community name drop a little bit. Uh, when you take them to be processed, who's your processor? We use T and E Meats in Harrisonburg, Virginia. Uh, they're a USDA inspected facility, um, and so what that means is you you can have your own animals processed at a state inspected facility, but you cannot sell that meat to anyone else. You can only eat it for yourself. Okay. Uh, what I do is I send it to a USDA inspected facility so that animal is processed under inspection. And what that means is I'm allowed to resell that meat either by the whole half quarter or by the individual cut. And they've done a, we've used them for about 10 years and they've always done a great job. Uh, that's just another benefit of, of small farms is um, to talk about how all of my business is done here in this local community. That when, when you buy a chicken at Walmart, you're sending money to Walmart, you're sending it to Tyson Foods. If you buy a chicken from me, you know, I bought my chicken from a local hatchery. My grain came from this cow. All the money stays local and money has this circulatory power that when it gets sucked out of a community, it's devastating. But when the longer that money can stay in your community, it has a ripple effect. And I think that this nation, you know, work is an important important part of life. And so any way that we can strengthen the local economy is good in my book. And I, I see small farms as a key component of a healthy nation and a healthy economy. Uh, I think something that I would like to share is just how exciting all this is, that, you know, there are farmers who have been doing this for a long time and the things that they're reporting back are very encouraging. I, I'll just share one story. There's a fellow named Gabe Brown and he bought a ranch in North Dakota, a you know, 5,000 acre ranch. Uh, it, you know, it's prairie, but it had just been used and abused for a hundred years. So the soil was just lifeless. And so for the last 20 years, he's been doing kind of what I'm doing, but in, uh, in crop, crop agriculture, right? So he does crop rotations and anything like that. He has seen his organic matter go from 2%, which is extremely low, to 13% in 20 years. That is huge. Um, he, he has now surpassed the health of the native prairie. They have native prairie in North Dakota. His land is healthier than native prairie. He's done that in 20 years. He's done it in a way that's been profitable. He's done it in a way that's supported his local community. And he's, um, he's basically healing nature faster than nature can do it on its own. Um, just one quick little thing. They did a, uh, what's called a water infiltration test. So what they do is how fast can water soak into this soil? Uh, when he first started out, his land could only take in a half an inch of rain per hour. So if you had a, a gully washer, it just flowed off. Now, they did it 20 years later, his fields can take eight inches of rain per hour. I've never seen an eight inch of rain per hour. Yeah, okay, so a deluge. And, and that just, you know, in this era of climate change, we need to start getting really smart and really creative. What, what are some ways, what are some things that we can do to make our landscape and our agriculture more resilient to climate change? And, and that's a perfect example that if, if I have a landscape that can soak up the rain like a sponge, baby, I want that. You know, that's, that's good for everybody. Well, your carbon footprint is also diminished. Uh, especially when you stay local and you stay within your areas, and yeah. I think that you're not shipping, you're not, no. you're not, you're not taking up, you're, you're not using trucks, you're not, you're, you're keeping it. Pardon the weird phrase, close to the earth. Yeah. Um. So you're you're not producing as much negative waste right. that is messing with the atmosphere, messing with the land, mm -hmm. and I think that uh, when we move back to that. 
and, and you could probably agree that it, it, it is better for everybody. Well, I'm glad you brought up carbon. Um, obviously, CO2 is a, a big issue these days. Uh, I do believe that the earth is getting warmer, and I think it's because of the carbon that we're putting into the air. Agriculture done this way pulls CO2 out of the atmosphere and sequesters it in the soil in a stable form. So when I say that uh, Gabe Brown raised his soil organic matter from 2% to 13%, that's carbon. That's carbon that was free floating in the atmosphere and is now locked up. Um, somebody did the math on this and they said, if we took all the cropland, okay, if we took all the cropland in the world and we raised its organic matter, 1%, 1%, we can remove all the CO2 that we've ever put into the atmosphere ever. Wow. Wow. 1%. Now, Gabe Brown, has raised it 11%, and he said it's still going up. We don't even know the upward limit of what this can do. So it's very, very exciting. And, and that tells me we're on the right track here. When you see all these positive interlocking benefits, it's good for the land, it's good for the people, it's good for the animals, it's good for the community, it's good for our bottom line, it's good for the national economy. Uh, it's, it's a no-brainer. No good. It's a no-brainer. It's good, good for my belly. <laughs> and it tastes so good. It tastes so good. So good. Well, thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. And thank you, Kelly. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Solar Punk Life. And uh, thank you for showing us your small axe farm here. My pleasure. Please come back. We would love to. All right. And as always, Jason. Do good. Be good. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel.